Good morning and welcome to The Jungle. I am Whitney Mendoza, managing partner with Liger Partners. And this morning I am joined by Monique Mills. She is CEO of TPM Focus, which provides revenue focused strategies that synchronize marketing, sales, technology, and finances for companies that are starting up or expanding. Good morning, Monique. Good morning. Thank you for joining me. Um, we have talked before prior on Zoom, just Whitney and Monique, and um, I'm so inspired by you. You do so much uh, just personally and to also help small businesses and startups. So I'm excited to, to chat today. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. So tell us about TPM Focus and why you started this business. So I... I mean, honestly, TPM Focus got started by accident. You know, I started out, I'm a degreed engineer and um, I went back to school to get my MBA and, and I started a, a tech startup, a software company. And uh, things were going so fast and, you know, I had accomplished so much in such a short amount of time. Um, people would start asking me what they should do. And, you know, like my professors would send people to me like, oh, you're doing a tech startup. You need to talk to Monique. And it got to be so much. I just started charging. I'm like, hey, if you're going to meet me at Starbucks before class, I'm going to start charging for it. And they'd be like, yeah, sure. People started coming with cash and like, oh, I need 30 more minutes. How much more would that cost? And I was like, well, you know, um, Love and that's that. really how it started. It was just one of those things. And um, and, you know, here I am now, you know, my um, tech startup, I exited that in 2017, not in a big way, definitely burnout, but my, um, my consulting company still stands because it really comes from the heart from wanting to help people. Right. And so it's like, it, it doesn't feel like work at all. So I feel privileged for people to bring me in to their most intimate details of their business, um, and most of the time people come to me when they're challenged with something. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel privileged to be able to be brought into that inner circle to help them, you know, achieve a sustainable business or launch a new, you know, launch a new product. So, yeah. yeah. If only Starbucks knew how many businesses and oh. were formulated inside their doors. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um. Awesome. Okay. So technology companies, uh, yeah. and I know when, when you're starting out, there is a lot, right? Like you can have this idea for a business, but then you get into a lot of things that you didn't even know you were going to get that you were going to need to be prepared for. Yeah. Um, so one of those, I really love some of these questions you sit in, um, how to avoid waste when launching a new business or, yeah. or product. I love that because just as much as there there are the things that you don't know that you're going to have to face and answer, there's that one side of starting a business. But then I think there's the other side of the small things that you can get caught up on, right? Like the name. Um, yeah. You can waste a really long time trying to come up with your name when if you would just get your idea, your product out there, start something, start testing the market, a lot of times that problem solves itself. And you get to focus on more important things. So walk us through that. How do we avoid avoid waste and know what to focus on? So fundamentally, in the in the tech startup world, we use certain terms over you know over and over again. And I know it's not common at everyday terminology for most people, but I can tell I can tell you that a lot of people have heard of the lean startup methodology. Mm -hmm. I'm sure many people have heard of that. Now at this point, um, because Eric Ries, the, the author of that book, um, kind of the leader of that movement in a way, but really the real leader of that movement is actually Steve Blank, who was Eric's professor at Stanford. So the, the premise of it is you can have a great idea, but it really doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter how great you think it is. You have to go through a process of customer discovery and customer development to really understand how your customers or potential customers per se are doing things now and really understanding where their pain points are um, so that you don't create something that it's, is really a vitamin 
Um, it's a nice to have, not a need to have. And that's really where a lot of companies get hung up in um, not getting the traction that they want in their business. So they spend a lot of time on the website, a lot of time on the logo, um, a lot of time on who's going to be in the C-level positions, where in reality, none of that matters if you don't have authentic demand from customers. Right. And you won't know that and, until you, first of all, get their insights on how they're doing things now, right? And without, when you're asking questions, it has to be done as, in a specific way. And a lot of people in marketing understand this concept of, customer interviews without leading the witness, without inserting your own biases. Um, and really that's the foundation upon customer development, customer discovery. From there, from there and only there, should you even consider what that solution should be once you identify that, you know, that pain point. So you think this is the solution and you, you can present it to them afterwards, right? After the fact, but even then it will be rejected. So it still takes a constant um, cycle of, you know, of course you have to speak with them, launching something, learning from that experience, how they use it, if they don't use it at all, why, you know, and you go back to pretty much the drawing board and iterate. And so um, a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs, businesses, they just think it's so great. They just want to go straight to the market and, and sell it and tell everyone how great it is. And then I get it. You have, you know, other uh, new products that don't really make sense, right? You're like, what's the big deal about that? You know, and that has all of this traction. Um, you know, very simple, basic. I'm not going to name some of the technology uh, or social media platforms that exist. That is really, I mean, it's simple, but you know, it gains all of this notoriety. So when someone comes up with something that they consider very clever. It's like, oh, if they if they could do that with that simple idea, I know mine, you know, will be impactful and it doesn't make it true. Right. Right. Yeah. I um, the market will tell you what they want. I remember when yeah. my and I started our first business, it was really a side hustle. Right. Like we still had mm -hmm. our full time jobs and much like you, we were getting asked, like, can you do that for me? Can you do this for me? We're like, wow, we've we've got a thing going here. And even after we started that business, um, new services were requested. Right. And when you get enough of that, you're like, yes, we can do that. And then you go find out exactly how to do that. So I love that yeah. That's great advice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because it works in like when I tell people that are launching software, hardware companies, you know what? The same thing works in launching service companies like you're launching a new product. Um, yep. Anything you're bringing out new, like you have to go through the process and you can't avoid you cannot avoid talking to people. And that's actually the part that most people don't want to do, which then leads to failure of the business. And, and when I say failure, I mean that they don't get the traction that they need in a quick enough time that they don't run out of money and motivation. So, you know, I always say that I help people figure it out before they run out of money and time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And even sometimes though we think we put in that research too, I mean, it really is listening to the diverse voices around us because, um, I, previous podcast guest, I just posted a clip on my social media about this yesterday, but Ethan Decker that joined me and we were talking about how Harley Davidson came out with a cologne and it failed like it bombed. <laughs> and I went and I watched the commercial that they did for it because you think of like loud and leather jackets and gruffy voices, strong voices. And it was like they tried to make it like this. French cologne. It was like, how do you do oh, this? You do it for you. That's so on brand. Right. And that is exactly why it failed. It's like, it might have been a good concept uh, in general, but again, the way that it was executed, it just, it didn't work out. So um, tell us why having those diverse outside voices uh, are critical when it does come to success. To success and kind of bouncing off back and forth those ideas because everyone that we have doesn't necessarily mean it's the road we should travel down. Yeah. You know what? I think people spend too much time in their eco chambers. 
Um, because like if we're around people, even that we know it could be a weak tie, you know, but you know, we generally like each other. Like, oh, I'm familiar with them. I like them. I want to see them succeed. We're going to tell them what they want to hear. Like we don't want to hurt their feelings. So the most important thing is to not get that information or get that insight feedback. Um, it's not objective. If it's from someone in your circle, if it's someone that you know, there is a book that I always recommend to my students. I, I, I also teach an entrepreneurship class at GSU. And I recommend this book to them. It's very, very simple in the way it's written called The Mom Test. And the premise behind it is that you don't ask your mom to validate your business or ask her, what do you think about this? She's going to tell you it's great. She's not going to tell you your baby is ugly. Um, and, 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 and you really, you don't want people to just break you down because, you know, they feel like they need to break you down, but really in a way to be objective. And the best way to do that is that, that kind of discreet way of doing customer discovery, which is talking to the people that you plan to target to buy this. So if we go back to Harley Davidson, let's use that for an example. Did they speak to their customer? Well, first of all, was the product meant to acquire new customers or to get their existing customers to buy from them more? Right. And so like, who are you, who are you trying to target now? If, if that was trying to target their existing customers, that was a big fail. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know motorcyclists that like focus on wear cologne, especially French cologne. It doesn't even make sense, but perhaps they spoke to their customers and a segment of them wear cologne, you know, um, but then if it's trying to go after getting new customers, who are those? Who are those people? Are you looking for a, a, a basically a repeat of your or, or to expand the customer base you already have, like more of the same type of people you sell to? Or are you looking to tap into, let's say, a younger generation or, you know, international um, um, group of people? Like, what is it? Why? Why French? Right. Right. Fr why a French, you know, um, tone to the advertising and all of that. Like I, they don't make a connection between the product and who they're trying to sell it to. And the best way to do that, and I always, I always say this, if your marketing doesn't include verbatim words that came out of those, that target market's mouth, you've done it wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like when you, when you talk to them and you do these customer interviews and things that they say verbatim should be used in your marketing because it signals, it's kind of a dog whistle to more people like them. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to expand or you're trying to attract, you know, more people, more of a population that you already serve. So, yeah. So how is launching something in the tech space differ from like a consumer product? It's not, I mean, some things that are consumer products are, you know, are tech. Um, I would say B2B versus B2C is very different. Um, B2B, first of all, it, it, it's very interesting because if you're selling to a small business versus an enterprise, mm -hmm. the mindset is, is very, very different on, on the customer side. A small business, purchases are very personal. It, the transaction actually feels like a B2C transaction. You know, they look at their QuickBooks, right? They know they're they're intimately familiar with their PL. They know, oh wow, if we add on this additional expense of twenty thousand dollars, we'll have to get rid of, you know, Judy's position. Like we can't afford this and that. On the enterprise level, who you're selling to, they're not typically as intimately it, it doesn't feel like it's real money, it's their money. You know, um, and, and having spent the majority of my career in corporate, I understand how that how that goes. And then becoming a startup founder and spending my own money. Oh, yeah, I'm paying attention to every Facebook penny, <laughs> you know, that's spent on an ad, you know, and selling to me. Right. I really have to know that there's need and there's an ROI in this in this purchase or not only that make the purchase as low risk as possible, right? Um, now, some people do that in enterprise and in the, in the product, I can see you doing that if it's a you know $100,000 plus product. But if you're selling a $500 product to enterprise, you know that's negligible on the P&L. Um, 
But to small businesses, that's a lot, especially if it's a, you know, it's a monthly fee. And so right. I always, I always tell businesses when it comes to selling, it's very intimate, the smaller the business. Um, so a lot of times, um, and really on both sides, people will buy, will try it. They will buy what's the least risky, not what's the best for the business. So sometimes most of it, it all comes down to marketing. Once you have a product, right, and you, you've confirmed through the process of, you know, the lean methodology, launching, learning, and iterating, you have this product that you know they need. And now you're trying to figure out how it can fit into, you know, their, their operations. And, and, you know, you have to prove that it's going to provide value to them. And, you know, sometimes it's a cost analysis, whatever it is. But even though it makes sense on paper, they can run the numbers and it make financial sense. It's still very scary. Mm -hmm. And to, to pull the trigger and the way to ease them into that is really through how, how you market it right? How you market it and how you present it, how you price it. Um, one of the things, if it's kind of a high dollar, and when I say high dollar, that's um, subjective, depending on who you're selling to. But um, I was just telling a client recently, I'm like, well, if you're selling a product that's, you know, this product was $35,000, um, find a way to make it affordable for them to pay for it. So, you know, there are relationships with PayPal where, you know, they can pay through PayPal, right. not pay on it for six months, over um, a dollar transaction, right? And then they can pay on, pay on it, you know, to PayPal, but you get paid up front. So figure out what those, what those um, other keys to, to, to help them leverage, you know, and, and create a low risk situation where they don't feel the hit before they feel the value from which you've sold them. Mm, that's good. Yeah. I love that. And uh, that it all comes down to marketing. It all comes down to like <laughs> every <our> favorite. <laughs> everything comes to marketing, marketing and sales. So I say, you know, so true. With good marketing sales is easy. It's true. It's very true. I love that. I'm going to cut that and post it everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's fantastic. It's so true. And um, as we wrap up, I really loved um, this tidbit about resilience. So yeah. tell us what that means to you and why it is so important, both in business and life in general, because Owning a business is not for the faint of heart. It's not. It's you know, when I'm speaking with new entrepreneurs or even my entrepreneurship students, I tell them that entrepreneurship, number one, is a life of rejection. Get used to it. Wow. It's every day. Yep. It's a life of rejection. And so you really have to um, get to the point where you don't take it personally. Although sometimes the way you're rejected can feel very personal, <laughs> um, but it's where the resilience come in because you have to remember why you're doing it, who you're doing it for, the value you provide, trying to scam people, you know, those kind of things. Like you have to know the reality. And even if it requires you to do affirmations for yourself every morning to jump back in there, because it's very easy, especially with, and I'll use startups for an example, um, especially startup founders that are, you know, just now having to sell something and put and ask, put their baby out there and ask people how pretty they think it is. Yeah. And it, they, they've left their jobs, their families counting on them. They have probably borrowed from 401k savings and all of this to do a new product launch. And it hurts. It's like a stick driven through the heart when, they, they're rejected in the marketplace and people don't buy as quickly as they thought. And even people who you did customer discovery interviews with who seem very promising, hey, when that's done, let me know. I'll be the first person to buy. And then they don't take your calls when it's ready to go. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So resilience is a matter of continuing to move forward despite all those seemingly setbacks. But it's all of those things that happen are opportunities to learn. 
um, you know, if, if they didn't take your product any, you know, they didn't take your product even after saying that they might just to have a conversation, you want to figure out why, you know, it is, it, especially if it's, it's something that you're internalizing and you're thinking, you know, something personal. And I think that's the main thing is like we in business, even though it's hard, we're human. You have to take, you can't take everything personal. Really, you have to like fool yourself to take nothing personal. You know, you email, you're doing code emails, you're doing marketing, let's say on social media, no one likes the post, no one shares the post, you, you're cold emailing, no one responds. Like that's this life. And, um, you know, resilience is, is really what you need to bounce back and to keep moving forward, to fulfill the purpose and to share the value that you're, you're, you created with the world. Wow. Yeah. Uh, one of our um, sales partners, Crispin Cruz of Sales Arbiter, always says that prospects lie and they lie all the time. I mean, it's, you get it. I don't know if they mean to. <laughs> you, well, true, true. I mean, you know, and sometimes yes, sometimes no. I think, you know, we're probably all guilty of trying to get the telemarketer off the phone and just saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I'm in the middle of dinner, but if you call me tomorrow, I'll pick up. Um, there are those cases. And then sometimes a situation does change, right? Like a business yeah. might be in a better spot to buy from you. Uh, and then three months when the product's ready, maybe they're not, things like that change. But yeah, it's um, you'll get a lot of yeses. Sometimes the yes is a real yes. Sometimes the yes is a no. But um, having yeah. that resilience. <laughs> you said sometimes the yes is a no. Oh, that's that's really that's really good. Now that's something that I'm going to put in my my um, <laughs> my notebook of notable quotes. Some sometimes when it's a yes, it's really a no. And also, I I had um, wrote on LinkedIn not too long ago because I, I I fell into this situation where it was like no really meant not right now. Yeah, and sometimes that's what that means, and I think that. You know, people are in through social media and engaging and all that. I think people are learning ways of communicating more effectively where they didn't know before. Um, there is um, a guy on on LinkedIn that I'm connected with. He's so smart, um, and he he's a sales guy, and that's why I love having sales and marketing. <laughs> Myers, the sales guy, but he's so smart. It's a couple of them. One is Dia Costa, and he's very good at using humor to break down that, that, that barrier that you have there. And then another one, he uses humor too. He's super smart in like communicating effectively where people feel heard, but he's a sales guy and his name is Josh Braun. And so I love, I, I learn like, oh, that's the better way to say that. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, in order to not make people get, you know, feel, um, you know, defensive and, you know, to feel like you're, you're, you're too pushy. And then you have other salespeople that really have that pushy uh, mindset and maybe who they're selling to that works. But, you know, again, everything has to be tailored to the customer that you're going after. It really does. Yeah. And authentically, right. I feel like yeah. that's where us as buyers, whether it's personally or buying for a business that we run, um, we're inundated with messages all the time, oh, right? Dang. LinkedIn connections that, uh, hey, I see that you do this. Have you thought about this? And it's like, I don't know you, right? And you're coming out the gate wanting to sell me something. I mean, that is something to keep in mind is that yeah. you really do have to tailor that message and, and build some rapport there before you can just dive in on the be authentic. Yeah. Like, you know, and, and sometimes you, uh, this is my thing. I just focus on meeting smart and interesting people and somehow somewhere great things come out of that in the future. Yep. You know, it's just, it's just, I just focus on that. And, you know, if I can be of service, if I can be helpful, I always let them know that, but I'm not trying to, you know, to get something out of people. And that's my reason for connecting. It's like, wow, I saw you did this article or you shared this post and, and your, your comments were like, they really resonated with me. And this is why. Anyways, if you'd like to connect, here's an opportunity to do so. Yeah. You know? yeah. And typically that's, that's what it is. And I, you know, I'm not sending a connection. I mean, a, a request. Oh yeah. Take a look at my website, which I get pitched all the time. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, 
But yeah, you know, people are learning. And I think there is a wave of those of us who do this every day. So we get it. We know how to really use LinkedIn. Um, I know someone who literally just got a LinkedIn account probably three months ago. Um, and so, but now we're kind of like, yeah, LinkedIn is old news. What's the new thing that's going to come in for professional networking? But there's a, always a wave of people um, that, you know, it, you know, there's the early adopters and then there's kind of the laggards that come along. And, and it really comes down to having exposure and network and knowing these things, right? They don't, they don't just know that this is how you do things. Um, but as they're exposed more and through the the blessings and curses of social media, a lot of people are learning the information and rules of engagement to be effective, you know, using these platforms. Mm -hmm. Well, Monique, thank you so much for joining me this morning. Thanks for having me. A great conversation. I'm glad we both exchanged tips. Like you had a one liner and I, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to put that in. I'm an Evernote girl. I'm going to put that in my Evernote Ooh. right now. Really? <laughs> I have all like, I will clip quotes and things like that off, yeah. off social and Instagram. Well, Instagram yeah. is social, but sometimes it's a screenshot off of LinkedIn and sometimes it's a screenshot on my phone, but I, I load all of that into my Evernote to keep it so I can kind of go back through and reread them. So super mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. All right. So how do our listeners, um, if they want to get in touch with you, learn more, um, do business with you, how do they get in contact? Well, I'm all over the internet from what I hear. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> TPM Focus is, we're, we're on the website. The, you know, the website is tpmfocus.com. Um, you can connect okay, right through that website. Um, you can also connect with me on LinkedIn, you know, so um, I'm, I'm easy to find. I also have a personal website called Monique Mills, Monique Mills .biz, which gives a, you know, a lot about my background. I, I found that before people want to do business and it's okay before people want to do business, that was when, so tell me about your background. So to save time, I send them a link and that is Monique Mills .biz. Um, and TPM focus actually links to that, but there's nothing about me personally on TPM focus website. Perfect. Well, thank you for joining me this morning. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Awesome. And thank you all for listening. Tune in tomorrow morning, same time, same place for a new episode of The Jungle. We'll see you then.